and welcome to Women in Policing. My name is Geraldine Garcia and I am an Assistant Chief with the San Antonio Police Department. The focus of this event is to provide you with a behind the scenes look at female officers' lives in law enforcement. It will also allow you to ask questions and learn all about the challenges and rewards this career field presents. For 38 years, I have had the pleasure of working with some of the most diligent women in law enforcement. Each of us come from different backgrounds and have different stories. Today, we have taken the time to share our stories about our chosen career field. You will also meet a few of our male counterparts, our brothers, who share this perspective on working with women in policing. I'm originally from outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and so I go back home, you know, I try to go home at least once a year. Whenever I go back home, my family, they, they like to sit around, reminisce, talk about just us growing up and how I was as a kid, and I was the oldest of my brothers and sisters and my cousins, so of course I'm labeled as the bossy one and the one always in control and everything has to be Deanna's way. and. When we were kids, you know, we used to play cops and I was always the cop. No one else got to be the cop, but I had my police hat and we would ride bicycles and my grandparents had a long driveway with a circle at the top of the driveway. And you had to, you know, just obey traffic law. And if you didn't, then I gave you tickets for it. And my, my mom, mom used to get so upset because my cousins, I mean, they were probably five or six, and but they, they could still ride a bike just fine. but. At this circle, you had to use your turn signal the whole way around the circle, and if you didn't, you got a ticket. But you know, we paid in leaves and different stuff like that. That's how. That's the way our system worked. I gave you the tickets, you paid me in leaves. System. So my my grandparents, they just love bringing that up, and they're like, you know, it, the way you were as a kid, it, it makes complete sense how and why you're a police officer now. Well, my story begins in 1994 when I immigrated to this country. Uh, back then, I didn't speak English. I became widow and I have two little daughters. At the time, they were six and eight years old. I immigrated to this country looking for the American dream like everybody else. My likes or my dreams at the time, law enforcement was not on, on that picture. I just came to look for work and work and whatever I could. My love for law enforcement really grew up in Mexico, where I was born and raised. Biggest obstacle going up through the ranks uh, was my own self-confidence. Um, I think at each rank I was at, I had a mentor. I had somebody who picked me for a job. Um, I didn't put in to go to homicide. I was selected to go there. I, you know, I didn't put in for the chief's office. I was selected to go there by someone who saw something in me that I didn't really know I had. And uh, each time I tried to promote, each time I started to take a promotional exam, I would question whether I could do that. I don't know if I can be a detective. Or I don't know if I can be a supervisor. I don't know if they'll listen to me because I'm small. Um, and those are things that I had to overcome, just my own self-confidence. Uh, but it was really a lot of mentoring from uh, males and females on the department, mainly males really, uh, who mentored me along the way to show me that you've got what it takes. Uh, and I appreciate that. You know, I'll be very honest with you. The time that I spent at the police academy as a lieutenant um, was probably the most rewarding time of my career. Um, I enjoyed police academy classes graduating. Um, I enjoyed seeing cadets succeed at certain things when they thought they couldn't. Because, it, you know, I never thought about um, being an instructor at the academy. Once I left, I swore I was never going back. I hated the academy. It was over. I, I never thought about ever returning, um, you know, to be part of the staff. I just, it was, you know, I was proud for the people who were there, but it never, you know, struck me as something that I wanted to do. Um, but then I was asked to go um, back as a lieutenant. Um, and then after I got there for a while, and I, I just thought, what an awesome responsibility. Um, and then it just, it, it was just so fulfilling to, to watch the cadets just, you know, they were so down on themselves, and it was, it was just so exciting to see them do so well. Um, 
it was just so rewarding. The best time of my career, honestly. So I have, I have no experience uh, prior to the academy. I had never held a gun. I had never been in a fight. Um, I do not have a authoritative type A personality. Uh, the academy prepared me for the streets and, and it prepared me for when I need to bring that side out. I went through the academy and there were several times that, you know, I, I wasn't sure I, I wanted to continue on. It was nights at home, crying on my bed. It was this job for me. And I think I, I questioned myself if this job was for me several times um, before I started and during the academy. I wasn't sure if am I the right person for it? Uh, do I have the right personality? Um, I can look back and tell you now, it was 100% the perfect job for me. There's so few of us that there's just no need to, to have that kind of animosity or, or, or distrust. Now, someone gives you a reason to distrust them, I, I get it. I, then I, if it were a male, I wouldn't want to be associated also. But there's so few of us that, that that's the least we could do for each other. And I have made some of the best friends on this department that were females, one in particular, Officer Thomas, Barbara Thomas, never knew her until she worked across the hall from me, and we are the best of friends. She's close to my family, she attends all of my daughter's dance recitals, and, but I would have never known her otherwise, and if I, did, if I just said, well, here's another female I have to contend with on the second floor at the academy, then shame on me. So I I'd like to talk a little bit about the fitness aspect. I know a lot of people coming in, especially a lot of the females, have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Will I be able to do it? Is it hard? What should I do? I think one of the most important things for females and anyone to know is that it's really, really important to come in prepared. You don't want to come in having not done anything and then expect to show up and be able to do the physical fitness. It is a demanding program, so some kind of preparedness is really important. Um, another thing that's really, really important, just as important as being prepared, is having the mental capacity and the mental strength to push through. Because I'll tell you, the fitness, it is going to be hard. It is going to be challenging. And there's going to be times when you want to quit and you have to train your mind not to do that. Um, it's really, really important just to never quit. And that, that was a mentality that I had when I went through the academy. I certainly wasn't the fastest or the strongest. And there's times that, you know, I was last on runs or the last to complete something. But the mindset that I had was to never, ever quit, especially, you know, being the size that I am, I'm not very big, um, maybe 4'11 on a good day. Um, and so I knew that, you know, I had to prove myself and, and it was all mental. It was all knowing that no matter what happens, no matter how long it takes me, I, I'm never, ever going to quit. It's really awesome being married to somebody that's four foot eleven. She's probably the smallest person in the department. Um, she is quite a firecracker. She's very, very capable. She's very, very uh, intelligent, and she has learned that regardless of her physical stature, she can handle just about any given situation. Uh, a lot of it is in how you talk to people, and a lot of it is in how you carry yourself. You have to have that command presence and that authority, regardless of your stature or your gender. Uh, the, the dynamic between the two of us is, is actually one of the best facets of my life. Uh, we understand each other and when I have a stressful day at work, I can relate that to her and explain to her what happened and without having to decipher or decode all the police jargon because she already understands and vice versa. She can come to me and with what happened at work or a scenario and we can talk these things through together to, to come to a resolution or just to decompress. It's, it's actually one of the best things ever. Um, and it goes back to what I had said earlier that if, if you are a, a female in this profession and you, you come to this profession and you're married or with a significant other that's not a law enforcement officer or even in the military, they, that person needs to be very, very secure in, in who they are because that may hinder your relationship at a later point in time because of what you do and the things that you see on a day-to-day -day basis that they may or may not be able to relate to. 
I'm part of the mental health unit, and they allowed me to stay there on light duty status, and that way I could help with the teachings that they do. They teach a lot of classes and the meetings that they have to go to, and I didn't have to go out into the field and put myself and my baby in any kind of danger or anything. So they were very accommodating. And then while I was on light duty status, they also happened to have a promotion, and I was able to promote up to detective. And um, so that's hence why I'm assigned to East Dog Watch now. Um, and the brass over there has been really wonderful, accommodating everything over there, letting me stay with mental health on light duty just for continuity's sake. So it's been a really nice transition. With you know the officers that I work with, they might handle things a lot different than I would have, or than I do. You know, I if I see that I can make a difference with a, a mom that's you know struggling with her you know, teenager that's constantly running away or doesn't want to listen. I'll take the time and, you know, I, you know, as busy as we are sometimes, I still take the time and I'll stay there for 30 minutes to an hour, whether it's talking to her about different resources she can use or, you know, talking to the kid and explaining to them, you know, hey, these are the only responsibilities you have as a child, you know, as a kid. Enjoy it because it gets a lot harder when you get older. You know, for, for advice that I would give a female, specifically a female, would be don't try to impress the males. Don't try to be a male. Um, don't, don't try to talk like them. Don't try to fight like them. You know, don't try to, to handle calls the same way they might. Be yourself. Um, you know, because ultimately, when you step outside your safety zone, that's where you're going to get yourself hurt, or that's where you're going to, to feel awkward. Uh, and so really, be yourself. And don't, don't try to live up to what you think the male's expectations of you are. And really, as long as you stick with the fundamentals of working hard um, and doing your best, the males are going to accept you. I guarantee it, they're going to accept you. It's when you do something that would be outside the norm or that would be uncomfortable for you uh, that the males are going to be able to, to see that and maybe think that you're just trying too hard. So ultimately, be yourself. No patch, jurisdiction, or distance can separate the unique sisterhood in law enforcement. Women in law enforcement have no bounds. Whether you are serving in the next state, county, or even across the world, we are united. We are proud to be a part of such an amazing, resourceful group of women who are leaders and passionate about serving their community and making a difference in the world. Good luck to all of you, and should you choose this career field, may you always remember what inspired you to begin this journey.